Welcome to the Spa Girls podcast, a self-publishing podcast for authors. You're in the right place for the best writing, marketing and publishing advice, plus interviews with industry experts and best-selling authors. I'm Cheryl Phipps. I'm Wendy Valor. And I'm Trudy J. Welcome. Welcome. And welcome. Now this week we have an exciting guest. I'm super excited because I've read his book and it's awesome or books he's got more books than just one but I've read um my favorite one is the secrets of story and it is Matt Bird hello Matt yeah hi Matt. Welcome, Matt hi everybody welcome thanks for having me on <laughs> so Matt also has his own podcast is what which is why he was just trying to welcome us to the podcast <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so Matt I will do your bio um so everyone um knows exactly where your experience lies and then we're going to get into talking about the secrets of character or um characters basically and our stories which um, Mm -hmm. Matt will tell you are super important and Mm -hmm. we all agree so um, Matt is a screenwriter teacher podcaster blogger and the author of the Amazon bestseller secrets of story innovative tools for perfecting your fiction and captivating readers and its sequel the secrets of character writing a hero anyone will love Um, he has an MFA in screenwriting from Columbia University and he lives and writes in Evanston where he and his wife Betsy who is also an author are raising two delightful kids welcome yes indeed and who we may see pass by you know you've got a whole window into my world here if you're looking at this I some of you are listening to this on podcast you will not get to see anything some of you are watching this on YouTube you will get to see occasional cats or children or wives pass by in the background yeah Nice a reason, a reason to go to YouTube, YouTube. right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Come see the cats. <laughs> yeah. So um, I l- recently listened to Matt's book, The Secrets of Story, on, um, on in the car, driving back and forth between our, um, our mountain house. And I loved it. Uh-huh. And I thought it was brilliant. So that's why I asked you on the show, because I was just wanted to pick your brains, basically. Um, <laughs> so, um, how, well, did you, a- uh, how did you discover the book? I think I was just looking on Audible for another read. I, I am um, something uh-huh. that with, and I've been looking into craft stuff recently, like just trying to expand my knowledge. Uh-huh. And and that was just one that um, came up and was suggested to me in the algorithms. And I was like, all right, I'll give it a shot. And there you go. I loved it. So I didn't know you beforehand. I didn't, I mean, I, okay. I've since realized you were on um, Joanna Penn's podcast. You know, you yep. obviously got heaps yeah. of, you know, but I didn't discover you from any of these places. It was just mm-hmm. algorithm. So funny good but, old um, algorithm all right yeah, yeah. So there you go it does work um now I wanted to talk um so we're going to talk about character and I had this little bit of a quote from your um from your book that I just wanted to read out just to start the discussion um so you did an MFA through Columbia University so you said in the first day of your MFA program a professor walked in and announced I don't know what the point of this is I can't teach you any of this stuff either you have talent or you don't um, and fortunately, we were paying him a fortune to teach us everything we needed to know. It was not money well spent, which I thought was funny. Um, and he was dead wrong. So you you say talent can be taught or at least skill can be taught. Is that? Yes, I think yeah. that talents, talents must be developed. And mm-hmm. that if you, you know, generally you start writing because you're like, well, you know, I am a, ta- I have a talent for writing, so I'm going to start writing. But you quickly discover that writing is a massive number of things that there's like several different disciplines within, you know, or several different skills within the discipline of writing. And if you're naturally good at one of them, you're inevitably not going to be naturally good at many of the others. So you may be naturally good at dialogue, but you don't have a sense of structure or you're naturally good at creating characters, but you're terrible at creating themes or, you know, I've always been good at theme. I'm like, oh, that would be a really devastating story. You know, that would be a really meaningful story, you know, but nobody's going to care about the characters. <laughs> so, <laughs> but then you, and then, oh, don't even, don't even bring me to tone. Uh, you know, you can have a story <laughs> in which everything is absolutely perfect and you've got perfect characters with a perfect theme and perfect structure and, everybody's like, but why do I want to read this? It's not exciting me in any way. It's like, oh, right, I've got to worry about tone. But I never really find that when you you have a natural talent in one area, you then have to develop all the other areas in order to let that one natural talent shine. And then by the time you've developed all the other areas and you've taught yourself how to write and all the different uh, skills that fall within the discipline, then you find that the one natural area that you brought with you is now underdeveloped compared to everything else. And you're like, oh, I have to, now I have to just teach myself everything because I have to teach myself that one talent that I thought I had. 
is, mm -hmm. you know, now you can't just rely on it. You know, you can't just, just rely on enough. instinct. You've got to know what yeah. you're doing. Oh, and gosh. so you inevitably have to teach yourself every aspect of writing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I wanted, because I really like this breakdown that you met, you did. And I just, this is just for the people listening to sort of go, okay, these are the areas that Matt thinks that, I, that you should focus on because we are going to focus just down onto character, but you've broken it down into concept, which is the, the beginning concept that you start with that you talked about you being really good at then you've got character structure scene work dialogue tone and oh no theme oh no maybe concept and theme are they the theme was what you were good at which one did you just say i i was good i was pretty good about those okay well, there you go so you're good at the big ideas the high yeah. concept as they yeah. say yeah yeah so um but we are so that is interesting to me and I'm now going to go into each of those areas and kind of go right what can I make better and how do I learn about it more and all those kinds of things um but we're going to talk about character today because that's something that you really hammer home in the secret of story and I'm clearly now you've got a new book out that's um all about characters so you say that it's basically that that's everything right like that's that's what people where need do you to get start? right yeah where do you start when you're forming characters what's your what's well your your thoughts on yeah that. i mean obviously character you know you have this huge issue where you can have the world's greatest story but it doesn't have great character you have you know i talk about in the book the war of the worlds is a great story it's a perfect story it's you know martians invade earth and they're attacking us with giant tripods or flying ships in the movie and then they are defeated by our own germs they're defeated by lowly Earth germs defeat the Martian invasion. That's a great story, but it doesn't have any characters. And they've never made, you know, a version of War of the Worlds that has great characters in it, that where the characters register. You know, they did an okay job with the Tom Cruise character in the recent Steven Spielberg version, mm -hmm. but ultimately it absolutely doesn't matter what character that is because germs end up defeating the aliens and there's, you know, nothing, you know, there's there's no room for character in that story. So that's, you know, that's a outlier and that that's a mm. successful story we all know and yeah. love even though it has no lovable characters in it but for the most part you want stories where they entirely hinge on the characters you know the characters people care about characters much more than they care about story if you're making mm. uh if you're writing something and you've got a big long description of the plot before you introduce the characters then nobody's going to care 90 yeah. percent of the time nobody's going to care i cite examples i sort of get away with in the book i cite examples like John Carter or Green Lantern, uh, which were movies that had come out recently when my first book came out of, you know, movies that began with these big epic stories about like, oh, 50 million years ago. And they tell the whole story of the planet before we ever see the hero go to the planet and nobody cares. Of course, I don't mention Lord of the Rings, which is another movie that begins with a big epic montage of the story mm, yeah. of the history. Mm. And those are successful movies. So I would have impeached my point if I talked about those. But generally speaking, people don't care about your story they only care about your hero they only are going to care about your story through the eyes of your hero once they once you get the hardest thing for a writer to do is to get someone to fall in love with your hero and but the good news is that that's all you have to do all you have to do is get someone to fall in love with your hero if we love the hero we will go anywhere with him or her yeah. and if we don't love the hero then we will not go anywhere then we you know we don't care about the world's greatest story if there's not a hero that we love and you know by love i mean empathize with not necessarily sympathize mm -hmm. with so a character who we you know feel for and share their emotions and identify with even if we despise them mm -hmm. that's what we want mm -hmm. yeah. so how do we start that process so what i talk about i'm going to jump to the second book um the second book is very specifically very hyper focused on the first 10 pages of your manuscript and I went ahead and I went back and read the first 10 pages of many, many great manuscripts, looked at, read the first 10 pages of many novels and memoirs. I looked at the first 10 or 15 minutes of many movies and TV shows. And I sort of expanded on something that was small in the first book and then became the whole of the second book. And that is this idea that we want the audience You've got to make the audience do three things in your first 10 pages. And that is you have to have them believe in the reality of your hero, mm. care about the circumstances of your hero, and invest their hopes in the hero. 
And so you need to get them to believe, care, and invest. Now, believe, I don't mean like, you know, believe as in I believe in you. I mean, actually believe, believe that this is a real person, not something made up, which is right away an extremely hard thing to do because it is made up and you are, you are just lying to them and they know that you're lying to them <laughs> and that this is all fake. And <laughs> that they're like, and you have to somehow convince them like, no, it's not, this is not fake. This is really real. This actually happened. These are real people. And even though it's set on another planet and everybody has three noses, <laughs> it's real. And then they're like, oh, and you've got to sort of shock, you've got to sort of shock your audience into going like, but that, that can't be made up. This must be true. This is a real story. This actually happened. And then you've got to make them care. And frequently these happen, boom, boom, boom. And on, you know, a really well-written novel, these will often happen on the first page. There'll be something where like, boom, oh, wait, this seems real. Oh no, something horrible just happened to the hero who I now, you know, this person who seems like a real person now just had something horrible happen to them. And then oh, it, they showed they had something in them that was a surprising reaction to the bad thing that happened to them that lets me think that I might be able to invest my hopes or dreams in this heroine. So mm -hmm. I talk about um, the Hunger Games and I talk about how, you know, right away on the first page of the Hunger Games, we get this heroine with a very distinct voice, with very distinct values um how and then we get this you know this ultimate opposite of the save the cat moment on the first page of the hunger games where she is deciding whether or not she wants to kill the family cat and she says the only reason why she might not kill the family cat is it's a good mouser so she's got strong values she you know values hunting and uh is the only way she can identify with or or find a reason not to kill this cat who is stealing, who is she has to share her food with is because it's good mouser and therefore has some value. But then, you know, she is, you know, it's clear that she is in desperate, she is desperately poor. She is in, you know, in she and her sister and her mother and um, the poor worm eaten cat are in desperate straits. So we care. And then she goes out bow hunting to kill some food. And so we invest <laughs> and it's like, yeah. boom, boom, boom. First page, believe, care, invest. I go through, you know, you can tell my favorite examples in the book are like, I go through uh, the memoir, Educated, um, and I go like, you know, boom, boom, boom. First page, believe, care, invest. How? And, but I go through it in the second book and I, oh, hold on my book. I go through it in the second book, The Secrets of Character, Writing a Hero Anyone Will Love, and show how every the first 10 pages of every single thing they don't care they don't care about the story in the hunger games like there is a tremendous amount of math in the beginning of the hunger games explaining the extremely complex algorithm for who gets selected for the hunger games <laughs> and they do not have any of that math in the first 10 pages they they do not explain what the hunger games are in the first 10 pages there is no story in the first 10 pages of the hunger games it's all character and that just about everything you write just about any good thing that you love that begins with character before story and you believe in the reality of the hero, care for the circumstances of the hero, invest your hopes in the hero, all boom, 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 right at the beginning. And that is how you come to love the hero. That's how you come to identify with the hero. And then the story begins. So how do we yeah. make them care? Like, is that just, or, or, okay, so believe is the starting one so let's start with that one how do you get someone to believe in the character like is it just put them in a real situation is what i would kind of or, or create character make moments? them like relatable do you mean yeah, yeah like what is what do you yeah. specifically think that needs yeah. to happen you want to give them shockingly real things you want to give them you know yeah. a very distinct voice you want to give them very distinct opinions distinct objects uh unique objects in their hands you want to give them um you want to have them say things that you've heard people say in real life, but you've never heard people say in fiction. You want to have them, uh, you want to give them distinct mm -hmm. physical characteristics. You want to give them, you want to have, you know, you need to just have a notebook on you at all times as, you know, I'm certainly not the first person to tell writers to do that, in which you note things where it's like, I've never seen that before. I That's something I see all the time in real life and I've never seen in a movie. You know, I talk about, uh, the wonderful movie in education, how like even just in the beginning, we see this montage of them in their school life and they're putting the they're putting the palm of their fist um, or the bottom of their fist up against the window of the school on a rainy day and making it look like a baby foot and then dotting in the toes of the baby foot. 
and how I'm like, oh, I did that, you know, and I remember doing that in school, yeah. and I've never seen that done in a movie before. And now I'm like, oh, this is real, you know, this is my life, mm -hmm. this is a character I can identify with. This yeah. is something, you know, just because, and it would seem like that would be impossible given how many novels are published, uh, especially <laughs> how many novels are self published, that they're, you know, you've got thousands a day. And the idea that you're going to write something that has never been captured before seems impossible, but it's really not because life is fast and multifarious mm -hmm. and there are all sorts of things. You know, I talk about watching the pilot for the TV show Community and the dean of the college says, you know, starts to read a speech on cue cards to the students and he is missing a cue card, which turns the whole speech into this tremendous insult with a cue card missing. And then he realizes that the cue card is missing and he says, oh, no, I'm missing a cue card. Everybody quick, look around your immediate areas. And I heard that and I just flashed back to my childhood and being told in school, look around your immediate area. I don't know. I don't know if this is something I have in New Zealand. I don't know yeah. if that's a phrase you're familiar with. That was something yeah. I was told by my teachers frequently. Yeah. And uh, and I'm like, oh, oh, I'm back. I'm back in my childhood. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, generally speaking, you're going to get, you know, if I had to give one piece of advice in terms of getting us to believe in a character, believe in the reality character, it's to give that character a unique object that uniquely... Um, you know, is gives that character some personality, give them a, you know, I talk about metaphor family is something I talk about in my first book and my second book. I talk about have them use language in a way that is consistent to the character and is not something that, you know, is very unique. I talk about Game of Thrones and how, well, I talk about in the second book how it's very important to be repetitive how you establish what's going on with this character and then you just hit it over and over and over again even in those first 10 pages i show the beginning of little women and how little women we begin with the first paragraph says a little bit about each of the four girls and makes clear their personalities and then two pages later there's something about each of the four girls and makes clear their personalities and you know the same personalities that we're not seeing you know different elements of these characters we're seeing the same element of these characters and then it happens like four different times in the first 10 pages how they're like this girl to this this girl to this this girl to this this girl to this and it's like oh by the time you get to page 10 of that novel you're like i know these characters deeply mm -hmm. and i talk about how like when one of the misconceptions people have about writing is they're thinking like they want people want to constantly be surprised by characters and they want to go like, oh, I had no idea the character was going to do that. When what readers actually prefer is readers like to say, oh, I knew the character was going to do that. Yeah, and they like that. Yeah, they yeah. they like yeah. that when they read Little Women, they're like, oh, that's so Amy. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, yeah, I knew yeah. Amy would do that. Yeah. Oh, what an Amy kind, thing to say. It's very true because when you think about those four girls, yeah. you kind of know that Joe is the one that's the journalist and is going to, you know, she's a bit of a tomboy. Yeah. You know, yeah. you, know, you, yeah. you kind of know the different characters of those girls. Yeah. And, and yeah, like, and you're saying it's just the writing. It's down to the writing and yeah. um, and how she put that together. Another, you, you skipped over it quickly, but I wanted to talk about metaphor families because that's not something I necessarily thought about as much as um, you were talking about. And you talked about, um, I think it was you that Star Wars, um, Obi Wan Kenobi, and how he yeah. when he first gets introduced. So you could go through that for us. Well, I talk about so. I mean, often you'll have character and they'll have a metaphor family, and it'll be somewhat you know understandable. You know, like you're watching Thirty Rock, and you know you've got this you know corporate. You know, Jack has this corporate metaphor family because he's a corporate CEO, but it's unique in that it's this sort of new agey corporateness, and he's like you know speaks about you know corporate. Um, his corporate profession, but in this sort of new agey way. But then often you'll have people who they'll have a very unexpected metaphor family, like Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars, his metaphor family is military. Like his, you know, he's this new agey hermit and he is this spiritual mentor, but he keeps talking about like, you know, oh, they always write single file to hide their numbers and, you know, blast marks are too precise and, you know, hurry son, they're on the move. And it's like, he talks like a general and indeed he did used to be a general, but we don't know that yet. We don't really find that out for a while. But it's, you know, where I talk about Dwight on The Office, how, you know, he works in a paper company, but his metaphor family is military, which in this case, he was never a general, but he is just someone who is deluded and sees his job in this paper company as having this sort of military precision to it. Mm -hmm. And so he is using this sort of military um, 
metaphor family that is completely separate from them, where I talk about like Lily on How I Met Your Mother and how, you know, she has this sort of hip hop metaphor family, even though she is a white kindergarten teacher and how <laughs> you can have these surprising metaphor families. But generally speaking, you're going to have, you know, someone who, who it's not that surprising. It's not completely incongruous. Those are sort of the exceptions that prove the rule. But generally speaking, you're going to want to have one, one thing that is going to be their source of metaphors that is going to be their source of, you know, I talk, well, I talk about, I talk about Dan Rather. Um, I don't suppose you guys know who Dan Rather is, uh, but uh, there was a, um, I talk about how one of the worst things you can do as a writer, here to a second, let me go ahead and find Dan Rather here. Um, one of the worst things you can do as a writer is you can go like, well, you know, when things are very exciting, then there's no time for character. Those aren't character scenes. Plot scenes aren't character scenes. You know, oh, I'm going to have these scenes where all the plot's going on. There won't be any character in those scenes. But then when the plot's done and it settles down, then I'm going to have the characters sit down and look off in the distance and talk about their character. And then I'm going to have them establish their character once they have a chance to calmly sit down and look off in the distance and talk about their character. Obviously, that's terrible it writing. Awful. You, <laughs> you, <laughs> don't do that. you don't want to do that. You want to have plot revealed you want to have character and plot be revealed at the same time. And the more and the faster things go, the more character is revealed, not the less character is revealed. And I talk about how on a normal news day, Dan Rather used the same stentorian language as any other news anchor. But when things got crazy, his language transformed. Those of us who watched his reaction to the 2000 election night crisis, this is when it was unclear who had won the election, George W. Bush or Al Gore, are still trying to pick up our jaws off the floor. Dan revealed his unique metaphor family, rural Texas. So as he is hosting this thing, he suddenly starts saying, it's too early to say he has the whip hand or don't bet the trailer money yet. Or this race is about as tight as the rusted lug nuts of a 55 Ford. Or you talk about a ding dong knockdown get up race or the presidential race is still hotter than a Laredo parking lot. And so this is someone who has spent his whole life trying to hide the fact that he is this rural Texas metaphor family, and he's trying to be a generic bland Midwest newscaster. But then when things get, you know, when things got really hairy, when there was a big crisis, then suddenly his actual metaphor family came out and how that's how you should write. <laughs> you should write in such a way where characters reveal more and more of their character, the more hairy things get. It's yeah. like creating a connection, isn't it? Because you're you're actually getting to know the character, and mm. and you and you think you know a, a lot about them, and and it, through the the course of the book, you just get deeper and deeper into that character, and then they so. display some sort of characteristic that you didn't expect from them, and there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I talk about how you know eventually, you know what you don't expect in Little Women is for Amy to marry Laurie. Mm. Yeah, no, and, no, that was out of left field. Yeah. And so you, you know, you think like, you know, Amy so well, and you're mm -hmm. like, oh, that's so Amy. Oh, I know Amy so well. And then Amy can still surprise you at the end of the book. Yeah. But it's not shocking. You know, you realize like, oh, OK, I can see how we were headed this direction. I can mm -hmm. see how Amy would end up with Lori. And, you know, it, it feels very satisfying. I don't know. Yeah, were you saying you don't find it satisfying? Do you don't buy it when Amy marries Lori? Um, yeah, I mean, I just. I, I completely understand why, because she, you know, needs a security and she's fallen in love with him or whatever. But um, <clears throat> for me, it was like, okay, I didn't see that coming. <laughs> maybe I wasn't, maybe I wasn't paying He wasn't meant for her. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I didn't think he was meant for Joe either, to be honest. No, but, no, you know, no, like, no. I, yeah, I just, it was like, whoa, you know? Yeah. 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 But it's Which less funny. it's less important to her that she ended up with someone who she was meant for than it is to Joe. I think Joe yeah. is like, you know, yeah. this would, yeah. I would be yeah. betraying myself if yes. I married Lori, whereas Amy is like, he's rich. Yeah. Um, and, uh, He'll yeah. do very nicely. Yeah. He'll and look nice after my yeah. he, uh, He's willing to him. accept me as a second best substitution for Joe. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, that sounds good to me. Yeah, and, exactly. uh, yeah. But uh, But I think that it's, I think that it is not, you know, you need to then establish your character so well and then still have surprises for your reader, but the surprises need to be things mm -hmm. that still fit with the character as yeah. initially established. Not but, I was going to say, so, you, yeah, yeah, you no, can't exactly. do something that would be completely like against the character, what you've set up, right? Like that wouldn't, that's no. not what you're talking about. So it's not something that isn't conceivable within the, the characteristics that you've set up for them. Is that right? Yeah. And you need to surprise, you need to, 
you know, it's okay if you let people think, oh, I know Amy. I know exactly what Amy will do. I know where this novel is going. I know where this is going to end up. And then it's okay to let people think that and then surprise them. And then they'll be much happier if you do surprise them, but surprise them in a way where they're not going to be like, you know, feel yeah. betrayed or like this yeah. character, yes. this is yeah. going in completely against the characters, yeah. um, completely against who the character is. Like I talk about, I give another example of a character that is hit many times in the first 10 pages. And I talk about Theon in Game of Thrones and how I talk about, I, I, start off by talking about three different novels where they have to introduce a bunch of siblings all at the same time. And I talk about um, Little Women, I talk about Little Fires Everywhere by Celeste Ng, and I talk about Game of Thrones by George R. R. Martin and how I show how they very quickly introduce, you know, contrast the siblings in the first 10 pages. And I talk about Theon in Game of Thrones and about how like the first time he's introduced is, you know, and then came Theon, Edward Stark's ward, who found everything amusing. And that's that's a great believe moment because that's something where it's like, we've all met someone who finds everything amusing. I've never seen a character introduced that way. And mm. then and then instead of then complicating that, it then doubles down on it over and over and over again in these first 10 pages of, you know, their father chops the head off of a deserter and the Theon then jokingly kicks the head around. And which is a very Game of Thrones <laughs> thing to do. And uh, so it's like, he finds everything amusing. He's kicking the head around. And then it's like, and then another thing where it's like, oh, Theon found it amusing. Theon found it amusing. And by the time we get to the end of those first 10 pages, we're like, okay, this is Theon who finds everything amusing. It is very believable. It is very real. It does not feel like any other character I've encountered before. And then of course, Theon ends up entirely surprising us by the time we get to the end of the story. Mm. And he finds, you know, what is not amusing in life. <laughs> and he, mm. he finds, uh, he becomes a more serious character in the end before he, well, I can tell you what happens in the TV show. I can't tell you what's <laughs> going to happen in the novels because we may <laughs> never know what would have happened in the novels. But yeah. um, before he uh, meets his fate. Mm. Mm. And he's kind of like, the, it's it's amusing, but he's also kind of, off kilter amusing in that he's kicking a dead head around like you know yes. like it's, he's not exactly a nice character oh um, no he's not amusing to us we don't no, find him amusing no. he finds us amusing that's a very very big are difference there, are there any kind of characteristics that you think we should avoid giving our characters like is there yeah or is it just whatever they are is what they are well, I mean, obviously, the number one that everyone always says is passive. That's the the number one thing that you can't do. You can't tell an interesting story about a passive character. Now, of course, there are examples there. My co-host on the Secrets of Story podcast, James Kennedy, you know, did a whole episode on positive passivity and trying to claim that that passivity is actually just fine. Um, and then I tried to fight back against him and <laughs> saying like, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going willing to accept any of these so-called examples you have of positive passivity. But you know, generally speaking, you don't want someone who's morose. Although there are great exceptions, there are, I will readily admit there are wonderful stories about morose people. Generally speaking, you don't want someone who has no sense of self. You want, you know, I talk about how when we watch. When we watch a movie like Say Anything, you know, you would think that, you know, he's, it's about this loser guy who then ha is in love with the valedictorian girl and he idolizes her and he's this loser, he's this loser guy with this loser wife. And one of the things that makes him a loser, that we can see makes him a loser, is that he thinks he's going to be a kickboxing champion. And he's like, oh, yeah, kickboxing is the sport of the future. I'm going to be a kickboxing champion. And we can tell he's John Cusack. We can tell he's never going to become a kickboxing champion. But you would think that given that that makes him more of a loser, it would be something that would be off-putting to us as readers or viewers of the movie. And it's, in fact, just the opposite because he believes in something. He believes in himself. Mm -hmm. And if you if the character believes in himself in a totally deluded, off-putting way that would make them off-putting as a person in real life, then we like that more as an audience. We want the, we generally speaking, want a hero to believe in themselves, even if it's in a totally stupid and deluded way, rather than having someone who is more reasonable, you know, someone who has a better sense of their strengths and flaws. Ironically, one of the, we, in real life, we like 
to meet people. We like to befriend people who have an honest evaluation of their strengths and flaws. Someone who isn't constantly going to be coming up to us and going like, oh, wait, 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 I've, I've solved the world's financial crisis. Listen to this. We generally don't want that in real life, but we want that in fictional characters. It's one of the things we want people who have a strong sense of self and it is, and often who are completely deluded and who are completely, um, you know, off on quest tilting at windmills that we can see is wrong. One character that always comes to mind that I never understood why I calmly accepted this scene was in Pulp Fiction, where he accidentally shoots the face off of the guy in the back seat. <laughs> And I, and I was like, that's horrific. <laughs> and it's this horrible thing. But they kind of end up having this argument over what the hell? You've just ruined my, my car. Yeah, like it, it was wasn't even, yeah. they weren't even worrying about the fact that there's now a dead person. And it was, yeah. and it's kind of what you're talking about here. It's like, well, they had a really strong sense of self. They, mm. it was who they were. They weren't, yeah. So maybe that mm. explains why I accepted that scene. <laughs> yes. Oh, they... too, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there was was there an example in your book I think you gave of like a um I can't remember what the movie was where you end up rooting for the um the bad guy that that the, they sink a car into the bottom of the lake to get rid of a body I think it was yes yeah, and then the car and the car psycho. bobs back up and then you yeah. end up going no the car he's going to get caught and it's kind <laughs> of the opposite of what you should be thinking about is that how does that yeah work? Alfred Hitchcock Psycho is you know this guy knew he was the world's greatest filmmaker and he's like, I'm going to set myself the ultimate challenge. And so, you know, he made this movie about this woman with a secret lover who was working in a bank and then there was a big cash deposit and she decides to steal the cash deposit and go out on the road. And she then stops in a motel while she's on the road and she meets the creepy desk clerk. And then suddenly the creepy desk clerk kills her while she's in her shower. And it's like, but she's been our heroine. She's the whole reason we've been watching this movie for the first 40 minutes. And suddenly she meets this guest clerk and then the desk clerk kills her. And then we quickly realize the movie is actually about the desk clerk, this yeah. desk clerk who didn't <laughs> yeah, appear yeah, until 40 yeah. minutes into the movie. Yeah. And like, all we know about this guy is he killed our heroine who we cared about. And that's all we know about this movie is that now our heroine who we've covered is dead and this creepy dude has just killed her. And then we see him chop her up, put her in the trunk of her car, drive the car to the lake, push the car into the lake. And then suddenly, yeah, as you said, the car goes down into the lake and then it bobs back up. And what we think is, oh no, our hero is going to get caught. <laughs> and because all of a sudden we have completely transferred our allegiance yeah. from mm. the bank clerk to the person who chopped her up and is stashing her body in the lake. Because this is a master filmmaker who is just completely having messing fun with us <laughs> and he's messing yeah, with us yeah. and he's like i can make you care about anybody i can make you care about this bank clerk and then boom make you care about the person who killed her and make you worry that he's gonna get caught and mm -hmm. even though like of course we should want him to get caught he killed our heroine mm -hmm. like this is our villain we want the villain to lose but no he's all we're left with now we don't have a hero anymore so this is our hero and all of a sudden we have this brand new hero and we're rooting for him to get away with killing all sorts of people now. And then it's it's a master, obviously, do not do that, please. <laughs> Self-published romance authors of New Zealand, my core audience who I'm talking to here, do not kill off your hero 50 uh, pages in and then have us suddenly fall in love with the person who killed the hero. Of course, you can do it. You can do it all you want if you are a master of your art. <laughs> and um, yeah. anybody can get away with anything if they're a master of the art. So my co-host on the Secrets of Story podcast, James Kennedy, is always saying like, oh, I'm worried that beginning writers will listen to the advice on our podcast and be led astray. And I'm like, well, it's good to know what rules you're breaking. Mm -hmm. And it's also good to know you can break them. And I don't think we ever say on our podcast like, OK, here's what you absolutely can't do. Mm -hmm. We say you need to be aware if you're going to suddenly kill off your heroin and have us fall in love with the person who killed her 40 pages in, you need to be aware that's difficult. You need mm -hmm. to be aware that's not what the hero thinks that you need to be aware that's not what the reader thinks they want. Mm -hmm. But you also, of course, you can be aware that if Hitchcock get away with it, you go away with it. You might be the next Hitch the next Hitchcock. Yeah. You might be the next Louisa May Alcott. You might mm -hmm. be the next whoever. And James yeah. is always like, 
oh, I'm worried, you know, if the next James Joyce is listening to our podcast, he's going to be dissuaded from writing The Next Finnegan's Wake. And I'm like, first of all, I don't think the next James Joyce is going to be dissuaded from writing Finnegan's Wake. I think he's I think he's got enough of a sense of self that he's going to write it no matter how much. I, mean, I don't think he wrote that book because no one had ever told him that's not how you're supposed to write a book. Yeah, I exactly. think that he knew that's not how you were supposed to write a book. And I think that, you know, if anything, telling these people the rules is just going to make them even more excited to break them. So yeah. I don't mind telling people the rules, knowing full well that they may, you know, that I might just be finding someone who is going to all the more enjoy breaking the rules once I've told them, you know, again, not what the rules are, but what you just need to be aware of what expectations the reader is bringing to your story. And mm -hmm. the reader is going to hope that you do certain things. And then you can, and you need to be aware what the reader is hoping that you will do. And then if you decide to completely attack the reader and assault the reader and upset, you know, I talk about how you can really write anything you want as long as you know how to set expectations. Don't, you know, you need to learn how to set expectations, upset expectations, and then reset expectations. So you can write whatever you want as long as you, instead of just trying to match reader expectations, which is, that's the basic thing. That's the basic thing in any job. I want to meet expectations. But then in any job, especially writing, if you want to then be a master at it, you have to know like, well, I'm not just going to meet your expectations. I'm going to first set your expectations. I'm going to lay out what expectations you should have. And then I'm going to upset those expectations and say, no, I'm not going to meet them. And then I'm going to reset the expectations going like, I'm going to do this instead. Mm -hmm. And if you can do that, you can do anything. So, have you got an example of that? Like, I'm just like, if, if what does it mean to upset the expectations? Like, someone, a character coming in that's slightly against the 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 usual um, stereotype. Or... Oh, in Game of Thrones with Daenerys. Yeah. <laughs> I, you so, know. Game of Thrones. You oh know, man, of, it's funny. I was I was looking through Game of Thrones, and I don't know, I don't want to spoil Game of Thrones, but uh, but I don't want to spoil what happens in the at the end of the series. But you know that i mean game of thrones they kill off the it's hero dark. yeah and that drove me mental book. like yeah. i i was i struggle with that because i connect and then i'm like wait a minute yeah. like wait yeah. a minute they they keep killing off heroes yeah. in game of thrones and then they come, up and up and they come up everybody <laughs> but that they, they're just constantly i mean there's no better example than George R. R. Martin of setting mm -hmm. expectations, reset, upsetting expectations, then resetting expectations. Like, you know, you get to, you know, you're like, well, you've just killed off the only character I really cared about. They're certainly the only character I was rooting for. Why should I keep reading it? And George R. R. Martin's like, wait, wait, keep reading. Give me one more chapter and then I will get you on a completely different path. And I'll go like, you know, up. you weren't, you were wrong to root for Rob, but maybe you would be right to root for John. And yes. um, let me try to win you over to John now, now that I have abruptly killed off Rob. And it is, and he's just constantly, you know, and I think that, I think that to a certain extent, he was keeping all the balls in the air mm. with such difficulty that he was afraid to eventually catch them. I think it's mm. not a mistake that he never finished that series. Mm. But, uh, and I think it's not a mistake. And I think it, it's not that surprising that people got really, really angry at the way HBO did finish the series mm -hmm. because they were like, they were like, you know, you didn't find a satisfying end to the series. And it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, because I don't think there was one. And I think that George R. R. Martin knew that. And I think that's why he's gotten slower and slower and slower as he writes, because he knows there's no satisfying end to the series. And I think HBO has only convinced him of that all the more so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think they didn't allow enough time. Yes, they that's rushed what it. I think. <laughs> they rushed it, and then they, if they just taken a bit more time with the whole, yeah. anyway, yeah. that's that's a whole different story. Yeah. yeah um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I won't, I um, so, what about vulnerability? You talk about vulnerability in characters. How does that work into this whole scene of what we're talking about today? I mean, I think that. People have, people have, like, they want, I mean, certainly with romance, you know, which, um, you know, we want, there's a sense of what are people going to root for in a hero? Are they going to, you know, what, what is the right time to have your hero show vulnerability? 
without, you know, because there's this sense of, I, I word I end up using in both books is badassery, and that people, writers tend to overestimate the degree to which heroes love badassery. And it's like, you know, you have these sort of strutting badasses. And I talk about, I talk about how at one point there was, I was called in to pitch, you know, so I went through a whole period of being a Hollywood screenwriter and I was brought in to pitch on, you know, the big projects of the day. And I was, you know, brought into these, you know, these meetings where, you know, they have you pitch what you're working on and then they pitch to you what they want their hiring renders to write for. And then they, you go through this whole dance. And at one point they said, okay, you know, we like your writing. We want you to pitch your version of our project. And it was a project where it was very similar to, this was many years, many years later, there would be a similar project called Orphan Black. Um, but this was, before Orphan Black, it was uh, a bunch of white dudes and who were living in different places around the country and didn't know they were clones of each other. And he said, and the great thing about it is you begin with someone who's clearly the hero because he drives a great car and he's, you know, having sex with a great woman and he's doing and he's going around doing all these badass things. And then he gets killed and we're like, oh, no, you know, this is our hero. And he looks like the star of the movie and he's just been killed. You know, we're so shocked. And I'm like, you know, because we thought he was going to be a hero. I'm like, but we didn't think he was going to be the hero because we don't actually want this isn't 1982 we don't want a hero who has a great car and is you know gets to sleep with whoever he wants to sleep with and does all these other things i said here is so i pitched him my version of the beginning i said that we begin with our hero he is a clerk in a music store he is in the stock room he is down on one knee proposing to his goth co-worker and says, you know, says, will you marry me? And she laughs and says, that's the worst proposal I've ever heard. And so then he tries it again and she keeps laughing and saying, no, 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 you're doing it wrong. And then we realize he's just practicing his proposal on her and he really wants to propose to his girlfriend. And she is giving him advice on how to improve his proposal. And then he then realizes he, I think, I forget what it was, he gets a call saying like from his girlfriend going like, you know, I'm, I'm leaving. And then he realizes he has to run across the mall to find her and then keep her from leaving. And she's upset with him. And finally he has to get down on one knee with everybody crowding around them in the mall and propose right then and there. And she, you know, and then the whole crowd's looking expectantly and she says, yes. And then suddenly his head explodes and he's been shot by a sniper. And I'm like, that oh. is, that oh. is your hero. Oh my <laughs> getting gosh. Killed. Yes. <laughs> I was in this. That's why that's so much better. Oh my god, you can see that, can't you? Did they and like it? Just, yes, I was like, yay. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about the fact that he was the clone. Right? We right you. Yeah. We Come on. You. <laughs> just him off. Well played, well played. <laughs> <laughs> I did not get the job. Um I uh, I did not I did not get hired to write it, but I was saying Should've. like, you know, that's what you know we want to see. You know, we want to see some vulnerability <laughs> if it's going to be our hero. And that's what we're actually going to, you know, that is, that is shocking. That is yeah. the moment where we're going to go like, that was my hero. I'm shocked he's been killed mm -hmm. as yeah. opposed to someone driving around in a great car. And it's like, yeah. oh, that's my hero. I'm yeah. shocked he's been we killed. Re we, we reacted predictably. Yeah. 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 Good. I mean, that's true. Good. Right, us? Yeah. <laughs> but I see exactly <laughs> what you're talking about, given those yeah. two examples. When you mm. say it like that, I'm like, oh, yeah, no, I had no kind of mm. connection to the dude with the, mm. the, you know, amazing girlfriend and the fancy car. You've got the connection to so the if guy. You've got a, if you've got a real slick hero who's, you know, wealthy, rah, 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 you have to show a vulnerability within him mm. for him to be relatable, right? Like there has to be, he might have it all, but he doesn't. Is that yeah. that's sort of the vulnerability you're talking about, isn't it? What I talk about how like even when people talk about like, oh, you know, heroes don't have to, you know, they don't have to suffer. You know, look at James Bond. James Bond never suffers. And I'm like, if you look at the first scene James Bond's in, he's called in by his boss and told like, oh, no, you have to cancel your assignation with this woman. I'm sending on a case. But first, let me look at your gun and takes out his gun and goes, oh, look at this gun. Nice and light in a lady's handbag. I'm going to give you the gun the CIA uses. It's a better gun. And Bond is totally emasculated. He's been told that yeah. his gun is a lady's gun and that he has to take a gun that the CIA uses, the Americans use. And he's given this other gun, which he sort of, you know, despises and <laughs> puts in. I'm like going, so even in James Bond, even in like the ultimate, you know, driving great cars, having great women, you know, leading this ultimate badass life. We began with this scene of emasculation and 
Um, and the scene of like, uh, you know, nobody respects me. Nobody respects me on the job. You know, I, uh, I, I can't have the tools that I want to have. I don't have the tools I need to survive in this world. And nobody and um, people, you know, I talk about how the most universal, if you're trying to get people to understand or identify with your hero, the most universal emotion of all is to feel misunderstood, that everybody feels misunderstood. Every one of all four of us sitting right here feel misunderstood. Everybody listening to this podcast right now feels misunderstood. And sometimes you think that I'm better than other people think I am. And sometimes you think I'm worse than other people think I am. And but one way or another, I'm different than other people think I am. There's more to me than other people know. And I talk about how anytime when we know what the character is thinking or feeling, and then we see someone else falsely assume what the character is thinking and feeling, and you know, go like, oh, you know, I know about you. I know what you're really thinking and feeling right now. And we know that's wrong. Then we intensely bond with the hero. If we know that they have secret honor, if we know that they have a secret that is other people are making false assumptions about them, because we've all been there. We've all had people make false assumptions about us and it drives us crazy. And it's one of the greatest things about fiction. One of the number one reasons why people love fiction is because of the intimacy of fiction. It allows us to intimately get to know a character and then know what no one else knows about them. And then, and this is something that George R. R. Martin is perfect at, that George R. R. Martin just so frequently, you know, we know, we, you know, he switches POV. He's got what? He's got, I think, 14 POV characters in the first novel. And he, is sta he stays in one POV long enough for us to, you know, intensely identify with that character. And then he switches to a character who just does not understand that character and wisely dismisses that character. And then we, and each of those cha chapters are meaningful in and of themselves and they're good reading and they're good writing, but it's the friction between them that is the real power of those novels. It is the friction of the POV switch between like, but, but this character, just doesn't understand, doesn't understand the other character, doesn't understand the secret honor of this other character that I know I have been in that said, as character said, I have been in an intimate situation and I, you know, there's nothing more intimate than reading a first person or women in third person description of someone. Like when you've actually been in someone's skin and then to jump outside their skin and to see someone else not be able to see inside the skin and not be able to see what we just saw. It's yeah. devastating. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So one of the other things that you talk about also is that even though there's 14 characters and you might be inside the skin of those 14 characters, um, there's always only one character that we would generally um, identify with mostly in that, mm -hmm. in a, in a novel. Is there, is, is that like, so I mean, it's kind of true for me in Game of Thrones when I think I, I've never read the books because the books drove me crazy. But the when I saw the TV series, I always identified with Jon Snow, where I thought that he was my main character, and yeah. then his and his sister, the one that had the sword, would became the assassiny sword person. Mm. Arya, yeah, Arya. Yeah. Um, mm. but is that like how does that work? Like it, we have no control over who that is. It's just whoever they most identify with. Well, yeah, I talk about how, and I would say Game of Thrones is an exception. I would say Game of Thrones doesn't, this doesn't really apply to Game of Thrones because, you know, you watch Game of Thrones and it's the ultimate exception to the rule that people will choose one. I mean, I talk about in the book how generally speaking, even if you're trying to write an ensemble, people will choose one hero who they prefer to be their hero. How it is not up to you to tell your reader who the hero is. Your reader will tell you who the hero is. Your reader will go like, I have looked at your characters. I have chosen this character to identify with. I have chosen, you know, not, and it's not who you think the hero is. I talk about like the movie Superman Returns and how they're like, well, we've, this, Superman's in the name of the movie and Superman is the character and he's wearing a bright red jumpsuit. And so clearly people are going to identify with Superman, but nobody identified with Superman because Superman is complete, morose, passive, creepy, stalker, loser, lame, horrible person in that movie. 
And instead, Lois Lane's other boyfriend is perfectly likable. And then when Superman gets almost killed, Lois Lane's other boyfriend somehow has a seaplane and goes out and hops in his seaplane and flies out to the middle of the ocean to rescue Superman. It's like, well, that's our hero. You know, you have tried to foist this hero on me who I do not accept and I have rejected. And instead, I'm going to choose this other hero. I mean, I talk about Paradise Lost, how like, you know, the hero of Paradise Lost is supposed to be Adam. Well, nobody who reads Paradise Lost thinks that the hero is Adam. Everybody thinks that the hero is Satan. Satan is a wonderful guy in Paradise Lost. He is a groovy guy. He is an intense character. He is someone who is, you know, who is driven by intense zeal and longing. And we, even though we know he's evil, we can't help but like him. We can't help but identify him when we read Paradise Lost. And this drove Milton crazy. Milton's like, no, you're you're not supposed to like Satan. You're not supposed to think Satan's the hero of this novel. You're supposed to think Adam is the hero of this novel. But nobody was actually going to feel that way. And how it's up, you know, frequently you will be surprised. Hopefully you will not be surprised, but you might be surprised as to who the reader will choose as the hero of your story. But I, Game of Thrones completely breaks that rule. I did not talk about Game of Thrones in my first yes. book. Yes. And yes. Game of Thrones... Yes. Like not because not only are you choosing constantly having to pick new heroes in the Stark family because then <laughs> because Eddard gets it. killed Lying. and then Rob gets killed and then you end up with John, but you've also got Tyrion in the Lannisters who is you know you hate the Lannisters but you love Tyrion yeah. and and never once never once do Tyrion's goals ever align with John's like I guess that's not true maybe there's a few times but they never like go like you know. I mean, they never make the, it's not like we like Tyrion because he's secretly on our side. Like he is, he is pursuing his own goals and like those, those books break all the rules. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, that's part of being realistic though, because I wouldn't expect Tyrion to actually follow Jon Snow's rules because Tyrion's got his own life that he's own, his own yeah. things surrounding him. And it's almost like a separate kind of, it's, it's almost but like two that, separate places with two separate But they're kind things. of similar, aren't they? Because they're both the least loved child, aren't they? Yes. Mm, and, yeah. Yep. and yeah, and everything's like put upon them to the most to misunderstood. Yeah, the most they vulnerable. are the most misunderstood. Oh, they there we go. It's all coming out now. Now I know yeah. why I like those two characters. Yeah. So, <laughs> if, we, if, we go, if we go back to Superman, because you, you talk about Superman versus Spider-Man slash Batman, and it's actually you, you kind of expect yeah, you talk talk about it. Like, explain the difference between those guys and what you talk about in the book. If you can I talk about how, um, oh, I'm trying to remember what I said. I said that you know we have in in I talk about how like Superman is. There's Perfect. been a lot of great stories about Superman, but Superman is someone who has very little vulnerability and very high professionalism. He is someone who is. You know, he's very good at what he does and he is nigh invulnerable and how it's you can write good stories about Superman, but they're harder. And then I talk about like you have like they make movies. He's, he's boring to me. Like, <laughs> I've never liked Superman. I never understood the because he's boring. It's, there's but a lot of boring Superman crazy. stories. Exactly. And then I talk about how, you know, there were there was a short lived uh, hero called Kick-Ass, who they made a couple movies about, who had no powers and no professionalness. And professionalness sounds weird. I forget what word I use. And who is, you know, a character who is the complete opposite of the spectrum from Superman. But then I talk about how you've got Spider-Man and Batman. Batman is a character with no powers, but he is ultra professional. He knows exactly what he's doing, even though he has no powers. And that's a good irony. That's a good, strong irony to get the character going. He has totally competent skill-wise, yeah. Total lack of powers. But then you have Spider-Man, who is the opposite side of it, in that he has great powers, but he has he's not professional at all. He does not know what he's doing. He is a sort of flailing amateur um, who has never built himself a bat cave, has never built himself, um, you know, uh, a batarang, who is someone who is is someone who is, you know, an amateur. And how I think that people, and that's also ironic. That someone who has the powers but doesn't have, you know, doesn't have the skills is ironic. Someone who has the skills and doesn't have the powers is ironic. It's harder to write a story about someone who has the skills and the powers or someone who has no powers and no skills. And that um, that that that's one reason why, generally speaking, if you poll people as to who their favorite hero is, 
um, who are the favorite superheroes, it's always Batman and Superman. Uh, sorry, it's always Batman and Spider Man are the top two people on most polls. Mm -hmm. I can understand Batman. I'm not a Spider Man girl. I must admit. <laughs> You, I think you prefer you prefer skills to powers. There you go. <laughs> he looks quite hot in that suit, though, just quietly too. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And I think Spider Man's portrayed as a young kind of schoolboyish kind yeah, of thing, whereas Batman's like the do <laughs> yeah. yeah. yeah, you're talking to romance readers here. Um, gonna be, it's going to be all about that. Um, okay. Just we, we're rolling into the end of the um, interview here, but I just because irony was such a big part of of the secrets of story, I just wanted you to. I don't know if it's easy to kind of quickly talk about it, but if you could, that would be awesome. Like, how, why is irony important in story, and how do we use it? Well, I mean, what we were just talking about that any time, mm -hmm. you know, I talk about how irony is any gap between expectation and outcome, and how. Irony is the heart of all meaning. If a story is not meaningful, that means it's not ironic. And if a story is meaningful, that means it is ironic. That when you're going like, oh, you know, this, this story, you know, like if, and everything can be ironic, your concept can be ironic, your characters should, your characters must be ironic. Your characters, you know, must have like, oh, this character is this, but this, you know, oh, it's, it's surprising to yoke those two elements together how you know your structure can be ironic your dialogue can be ironic your tone can be ironic your theme must be ironic that you know for a theme you've got to have if you're going to have a powerful theme to your story it's got to be it can't be like good is better than evil is not a theme the theme has to be a story in which the hero must choose between two goods or choose between two evils and you know choosing good or evil is not an ironic choice so it's not meaningful Choosing between two goods, choosing to, 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 you know, the choice at the end of Casablanca where I'm going to choose to help the war effort, even though I have to give up my true love, that is choosing between goods. It's a good versus good decision. Therefore, it's an ironic decision. Therefore, it is a meaningful decision. You know, it, choosing between two bads where, you know, like Breaking Bad, where I have to choose between... Um, putting up with this horrible medical system and this horrible system or becoming a drug dealer, that's a bad versus bad decision. It is ironic. It is deeply ironic that becoming a drug dealer is somehow the, you know, the more morally, you know, his life as a meth dealer is in some ways more morally defensible than the American medical system is uh, deeply ironic. And that, but it's true of everything. It's true of every aspect of of your writing. Is that um, you know there should be a you know there should be an ironic relationship between your characters' front story and their back story. That should be like oh this is you know ironically where they are now is exactly the opposite of where it seemed like they were going to end up in life. You know that's not shouldn't always be true, but it's a great source of irony. It's a great source of meaning. Characters will be more meaningful. If it is ironic that they are doing what they're doing, it is ironic that what they say is not, is, you know, there's an ironic counterpoint between what they say and what they're actually doing. You know, if they say, you know, you know, I would never, you know, I would, you know, if they're saying, if they're saying I would never fall in love with that man, but you can tell from the way they are grasping an object in their hand that they already are in love with that man. Yeah. then there's an ironic counterpoint between their word and their action. Mm -hmm. And that is meaningful. Yeah. I think there's a lot, it's like the hook. It's like the, the um, there's a lot of irony in romance stories. I think when you think about it like that, like, you know, a lot of, I would never fall in love with that man going on think, through a lot <laughs> yeah. of the stories. And of course yeah. love is all about it. Right. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Um, that's awesome. That's cool. Mm, very, so very cool. I think we are, we're running out of time, aren't we? Yeah. yeah. Um, so is there any last piece of advice that you would give um, our listeners to help them with character or story? Or... On top of all the advice yeah. you've just given us. On top of everything else. <laughs> <laughs> like golden nuggets here. The, the one thing that you think is most important. Um, I would, I would, I would say put an ironic object in their hand. That's my that's my number one piece of advice. So I've got yeah, I can go ahead. Uh, <laughs> I know that usually podcasts end with where can we find you online. I will go ahead and jump ahead and say check out my videos, uh, the Secrets of Story YouTube channel. They uh, there's a great video on 
ironic objects in their hands where I talk about the following the heart device in Iron Man and how oh, deeply yeah. ironic the heart device in Iron Man is yes. and how yeah. I, I go through and I actually play the video clips and I show how it develops over the course of the movie. So go to Secrets of Story YouTube channel, uh, Objects, Tricks and Traps. It's another great video. Uh, there's a whole video on irony in the movie Milan. There's um, And there's three new videos about the secrets of character, believe Karen and Fats. So I recommend those. I um, And yeah, once you're done those, check out uh, all 35 episodes or so of the Secrets of Story podcast, where we discuss more of all of this in depth with James Kennedy. Um, and of course, read my books. <laughs> the Secrets of Character, writing a hero anyone will love and the secrets of story, innovative tools for perfecting your fiction and captivating readers. Now you can see as you become more of an established author, you get more of an ability. And this is not true for self-published authors. This is true for traditionally published authors that you have to get the ability to fight for more readable subtitles. So you can tell that my first book, I had no input over the subtitle and this was them throwing in everything in the kitchen sink. And to this day, <laughs> this book came out in 2016 and I cannot say innovative tools for perfecting your fiction and captivating readers without <laughs> losing my breath. Whereas I insisted, I fought back against many other subtitles and I said, writing a hero anyone will love, that is a, a subtitle I actually yeah, can sign off subtitle. on. That yeah, is yeah. one I actually... Yeah, Perfect. well done. Well done on finding that. Where, where can we find those books? If you and we and you, is there a website? Um, I still believe it or not, I still have a blog spot blog. You go to secretsofstory.com and you will find everything. Um go to the books on Amazon. I'm very uh I realize there are many problems with Amazon, but I'm very proud of my Amazon reviews. So I would have a, I I'm always inclined to send people there because uh um I you know as you guys know full well, as authors, um, you know, there is no better one-stop shop for selling your book than your Amazon page where you have, you know, all of your reviews and where you have all of your um, data. And it's it's a very problematic company and I wish we could all get free of them, but we can't. So uh, <laughs> by all means, go to, go to Amazon, go to Amazon. <laughs> read the reviews and then go some other place and actually buy it. <laughs> go to your I love it. <laughs> go to your local bookstore, order a copy in at your local bookstore and support them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just cool. want to say I I listened to the Secret Story. I loved it. I thought it was awesome. I recommend it to all of our listeners. I think you should all go buy a copy of it. It's it's just yeah, it's everything together in one place that you need to think of, I think, when when setting out to to write a book. So it was awesome. Thank you. Thank you for being the person who wrote that Thanks, awesome book. Matt. Yeah, you're so welcome. Thank you. That's all right. So, um, where can we be found? Who wants to do it? Ah, uh, we can be found at spygirlspodcast.com and you can come and see us and support us on Patreon. Um, and we're pretty much everywhere YouTube, Facebook, you name it. We're out there. Find come it. Come and see, find us, Spy Girls. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you, Matt, and thank you to all of our listeners for joining us again for another mm -hmm. episode of the Spy Girls podcast. We will be back again next week, but for now, Farewell. Well, you later. Bye. Bye. Thanks, guys, so much.